for kids. Are there any children here this morning? If you want to come down the front, and we'll sing our song together as you come. And I'll need your help, please, Ian, this morning. Mm. Building up the temple. Here we go. Oh, you aren't turned on. Oh, that makes it even worse. That's all right. Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Building up the temple of the Lord. definitely had it this morning. Well done, boys. All right. Not that it's a competition, but if it was a competition, you would have won for sure. All right. Hello, everybody. We've got lots of kids here this morning. Some extras is wonderful. Everybody's here. Okay. So we would like to read some words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus' message is that God's kingdom is not far away and anyone who gives up their sins and trusts him can be a part of it. All right. And this is another verse which we've been learning recently. Let's read it together. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul, who wrote this verse, says the most important thing of all is to remember Jesus and what he has done for us. And we're working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. And so we've come to a special part this morning where we're going to hear about how fancy the Corinthians were or how not fancy they were. So who would like to be a reader this morning? Are you going to be our first reader? Okay. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were into Influential. Influential, not many were of noble birth. Okay, so he's saying, you people, you weren't that special. You're pretty ordinary. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Good. God chose the lowly things of this world and despite things and think that not to nullify to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast boast before him boast before him so what is boasting you don't know who knows what boasting is like telling somebody that you're better than yeah yeah them or something. when you're boasting you're telling someone that you're better than them and can anyone say they're better than God no. And when we stand before God, are we going to say, well, I'm better than him? No. People, Jesus, the verse here says, no, we're not going to boast before God. Okay. Here we go. It is because, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom for God that is our righteousness, righteousness, holiness, and red. Redemption. 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 Okay. So that means that Jesus is the one who makes us right with God. Jesus is the one who makes us holy. And Jesus is the one who saves us, who redeems us. All right, we've got one last verse. Therefore, as it is written, tell the no, one. Not let, 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 let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Okay. So let the one who boasts. Boast in the Lord. So instead of talking about how good you are, I should talk about how good God is. We should focus on how wonderful God is. And, um, and so this morning we're going to talk a little bit about that. And here we go. Oh. oh, it's Stefano. Hello, David. Hello, Stefano. How are you this morning? Very well, very well. Thank you. I have a question for you. Oh, we love questions here, don't we? Yes. So what's your question? Does God... Love tigers. Oh, that's an easy one. Does God love tigers? Yes, God loves tigers. Oh, 
That is very sad. Very sad. I don't understand. Why is it sad? I mean, it is very sad for you because you are not a tiger. I, I still don't understand. What do you if mean? If God loves tigers and you are not a tiger, then God does not love you. I'm Q E D. I'm not sure that's how it works, Stefano. I will think of you, David, poor and miserable as you are. So sad. So very sad. But Stefano, that's not what we said. But what? It would be very difficult for you to be near me now, knowing that God loves me and not you. But it was already hard for you to be near me, a tiger. So perhaps you will get over it. But Stefano, that's not what I said. Yes. That's not what I said. I said God loves tigers. I didn't say he doesn't love everybody else. That does not make any sense. Why? What does do God love tigers? Yes, God loves tigers. Well then, since tigers are so much better than everyone and everything else, how can God love them too? Tigers are the best. I don't think that's true. I don't think tigers are the it best. It doesn't? No. I don't Why? Think... Why, David? Why? Tell me. Tell me now. Well, just because God loves tigers doesn't mean he doesn't love everybody else. He made everything. He made everyone. He loves bah! us all. That much is obvious to all. Tigers are the best. But, but... But no, not necessarily. I mean, we're all pretty good, really. God loves all the things that he's made. Oh, okay. I think I understand. No, I'm glad you understand. So God loves tigers most, and then people a bit less, and so on. But why, why do you think yes, that? Yes, tigers are best, and God loves them 100%. And then people, not so good. So God loves them maybe 5%. 5%? What? Oh, you are surprised. Perhaps I am too generous. It is almost a flaw in tigers, being too generous. No, no, no. God loves all of his creatures 100%. Tigers and people and donkeys and chickens and rhinoceroses. He loves us all 100%. Bah! What nonsense. You think God loves everything, 100%? I think he does, yes. Ha! Then what about mosquitoes? Oh. Does God love mosquitoes 100%? When they sneak into your house and buzz around your ears when you're trying to sleep and then bite you. Eee! They go, eee! Oh, Stefano, I don't know about mosquitoes, but... The... Eee! Stefano! Yes, God made the mosquitoes and he made them for a reason and yes, he must love them. I don't really understand why, but he must. He loves everything. What is the reason? I, I don't know the reason he made mosquitoes. Ha! If you were a tiger, you would know. Well, well then tell me, what's the reason he made mosquitoes? Even if I told you, you would not understand because you are not a tiger. Goodbye. Oh. Yeah, that's not fair. All right. Well, that was a bit much, wasn't it? Hey? Tigers think they're the best, and therefore God loves them more than he loves the rest of us. Do you think that's true? No. 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 Does, God love, does God love some of his creatures more than he loves others of his creatures? Does God love some people more than he loves other people? No, God loves everybody the same. It's what we just read there in the Bible. Some of the Corinthians thought that God loved them more because they were special or clever or noble or wonderful. But Paul says, no, you weren't special when he loved you. You were just like everybody else. God loves everybody the same. Okay, so I think we're going to head out to Sunday school now. So thank you for being part of our church. We love you all 100% as much as we love tigers. So head Thank you. Please be seated. If you've come in this morning and don't have a copy of our notes, then please put your hand up and someone will bring them to you.
He was an Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he'd been the Archbishop for a long time. This is in the 1930s. And he was starting to get really quite old. And his body was starting to fail. And so he said to a friend of mine, I'm thinking I better retire. And his friend said, well, why didn't you do it five years ago? What's been keeping you? Why have you been hanging on so long? And he said, well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that having been somebody, I shall now be nobody. Having been somebody, I shall now be nobody. The world is full of somebodies and nobodies, and it does neither of them any good. Because that's not the way God intended it to be. Every human being, man, woman, child, even unborn child, bears the image and likeness of God. and has neither more nor less dignity because other people think more of them or have heard of them or think less of them or think they're special. Our worth is not based on what other people think of us. It's based in the fact that we are made in the image of God. So every person you meet, every person you encounter, is made in the image of God and is therefore of great value. But in most parts of the world, at most periods of history, and often enough in the church itself, people feel that it's better to be somebody. The cult of fame has reached monstrous proportions in recent days to the absurd point where many people are now famous for being famous. That's all they have to claim. Their name for claim is that they're famous because they're famous. We know their names. We recognize their faces. But we're not sure if they're a footballer, a movie star, or a fashion model. And Corinth, as a proud Roman city, was exactly the same sort of place, a place where people would look up to the somebodies and do their best to join them. Then, as now, there are obvious paths to political fame, to fame, political power, royal or noble birth. And in Corinth, they paid special attention to people who could speak well, who could make good arguments, people who could deliver a great speech, rhetoricians, politicians, lawyers, and the like. The wise, the powerful, the noble. These were the somebodies in Corinth. Paul reminds his readers that most of them were, at the same time, on the same scale, nobodies. As we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. When Paul first came to town and announced the gospel of King Jesus as Lord and the people believed it, most of them weren't among the wise whom society looked up to. Most of them didn't have any kind of social power or influence. We read of one of them, a man named Erastus, who was the treasurer of the city. We read about him in the end of Romans. It talks about Erastus, the treasurer of the city, becoming a follower of Jesus in Corinth. But most of the people in Corinth who became Christians weren't well known. They weren't noble. They weren't influential families. But that's not a big deal, Paul says. As he goes on in verse 27, he says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. The verse begins with some of Paul's favorite words, but God. And I've talked about that before. Some of the most famous stories in the Bible are about but God. Things were going wrong, but God stepped in. The world was lost, but God rescued it through Noah. The people were about to starve to death through famine, but God intervened through Joseph to save the ancient world. The people of Israel were slaves in Egypt and under terrible oppression, but God stepped in to rescue them. And these are some of Paul's favorite words as well in his letters and his writing. He describes a human situation or problem. And then he takes delight in showing that God has stepped in and done something to change it drastically. They were nobodies. But God has made them somebodies. Not the sort of somebodies the world would recognize as such 
but the only sort that mattered. And what is important in this passage is the fact, in this paragraph, is the fact that God has taken the initiative in it all. The Christian gospel is a matter of grace from start to finish. God chose these Corinthian nobodies. Verse 28 says, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one can boast before him. God called them through Paul's announcement of the crucified Jesus as Lord. As we've been reading for these last few weeks, this is the core verse for me of the whole letter together. Let's read it, let's read it, please. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul has come and proclaimed this simple message of Jesus and his death on the cross. And through that, this simple message, God has given faith to the people to act on that message and the will to choose or to reject it. Everything is from God. It is all from God. Verse 30 says, It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. It is because of him, all because of him. God has made choices and acted decisively to save his people. We have done nothing to deserve it, and yet God acts in love to redeem and declare righteous and to make us holy. The result of it all is, of course, that we have nothing to boast of. As verse 31 says, Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul will say later in this book in 1 Corinthians, the Corinthians have done nothing. They have nothing that they haven't received as a gift. Chapter 4, verse 7 says, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Why do you boast as though you earned this in some way? They have nothing that they haven't received as a gift. And if someone gives you a present you didn't deserve, you haven't got anything to boast about. There's a story that C.S. Lewis tells of a little boy who comes to his father and says, Father, may I have sixpence? The father says, what do you want sixpence for? And the little boy says, never you mind. All right, the father says, here's sixpence, off you go. Comes back the next day with a present for his father. Brings him a gift. Oh, my boy, where did you get this lovely gift from? I bought it with the sixpence you gave me, Father. The father was sixpence none the richer, C.S. Lewis says. And yet his heart was incredibly blessed. because His son took his gift and gave it back and used it for something glorious. The little boy has nothing to boast of. The sixpence wasn't his. But he used it to bring glory to his father, to give a gift to his father. In the same way, everything we have that brings glory to God has been given to us by him. Everything we have is a gift from him. And this is the same point that Paul makes in several other places where he speaks about boasting being ruled out by the gospel. Both the message, the announcement of the crucified Christ, and the way it works by the power of grace to change hearts, produce faith and life. In Romans chapter 3, Paul speaks of boasting. He says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. In this passage, Paul is talking about the Jewish people, including himself, who had the law of God and that they thought made them something special made them somebodies over and against the Gentile nobodies. But Paul says, no, it doesn't work that way. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul makes the same point again. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
And later here in this same letter to the Corinthians, he'll apply the point to those who boast about different teachers, whether it's himself or Apollos or any of the other leaders in the first century church. He says, stop boasting about human leaders. Let's boast about Jesus. But here in this chapter 1, he's talking about the classic pagan language that would have been used when people wanted to give themselves airs to become somebodies. The kind of social and cultural status that the Christians in Corinth were now so eager to obtain. They're missing the point, he declares. No Christian can, can boast of the status they possess because from first to last, it is God's work and God's gift. And in saying all of this, Paul is pointing to two Old Testament passages. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, the Israelites are reminded that they are God's people, not because of who they are, or because they're special, because there's so many of them, or because they're so powerful or so clever. No, God says they're special because God has chosen them. For no other reason. They're called because, not because they're special, but despite the fact that they aren't. They're called to love and serve the one true God out of gratitude for what he's done for them, not least the redemption from Egypt in the Exodus. And Paul wants the new Christians to understand themselves as God's new Exodus people, which we'll get to in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, with this same understanding of God's grace. God has just shown his kindness to us. And also in Jeremiah chapter 9, which is quoted here in verse 31, the prophet warns against the same kind of boasting which Paul attacks in this passage. Paul only quotes part of the passage from Jeremiah chapter 9. The whole passage is like this. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. Time and again, Paul takes the Old Testament phrase, the Lord from the Old Testament, which is specifically related to Yahweh, Israel's God, and he makes it refer to Jesus, the Messiah. Paul makes the drawing the point that the Lord of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New. Jesus is the one who has become all the wisdom that Christians possess. And all the status that we possess, our righteousness of being his forgiven, justified people. The extraordinary privilege of being set apart for service through holiness. And in virtue of the redemption, what Jesus has done for us. It is all in and through and because of Jesus. It is because of him. It is because of him. Are there any questions this morning before I come to my conclusion? For those visiting with us, I'd like to stop and see if there are any questions. Anything I've said that was unclear or you'd like to hear more about? Don't see any questions this morning. If you have questions or you'd like to talk to me about my th these things, my email address is there, my phone number is there. In these last days we've been uh, watching and um, seeing this, well, the, we've heard the story of Her, Her Majesty the Queen passing away. There have been a lot of stories coming out about her, her character, her nature, different stories about the way she dealt with people. And she's been the Queen my whole life. I imagine for most of you here as well. She's just been there, um, this person. And I have the utmost respect for Her Majesty the Queen. The story I saw through this week, I think through Susan's Facebook, Susan shared a message that once when she was still young, a young queen, she was uh, listening and the chaplain was preaching about the return of the Lord Jesus. And the queen said to the chaplain, oh, I hope Jesus comes back while I'm still alive. The chaplain said to her, why? Why do you hope that so fervently, Your Majesty? And she said, I would love to cast my, throat, my crown at his feet. I would love to cast my crown at, her, at his feet. 
There are so many wonderful stories about her. But she will stand before the Lord God, the same as you and I. The same as the most humble person who's ever lived or ever will live. Will stand equal with Her Majesty the Queen, Elizabeth the Great, on that day of judgment. Because God doesn't care so much about your parents and your birthright and your titles and your rank and your education and how many houses you've got and how big your car is. The Lord God does not care about any of that. He cares about your heart. He cares about how you stand before him. There are many religions in the world that teach that the way you're born is the way God intended it to be. You know, different castes. The people at the top, God loves them more, and the people down the bottom are untouchable and despised. That is not the Christian message. If anything, the Christian message flips that on its head and says that those who are despised by the world are most closest to the heart of Jesus. He has his heart for them. We will each and every one of us stand before the Lord God guilty of many sins and in need of his forgiveness and his power to save. We sang this morning, what was the the line that's gone straight out of my head, two two things I hear confess, my worth and my unworthiness. We are of incredible value because we're made in the image of God, and yet we're sinners, so we are unworthy to stand before him. But we can stand before him because the price has been paid for us. You are of great value because you are made in the image of God, but you are of infinite value because of the price that was paid for you. The blood of Jesus was shed for you. Therefore, you are of infinite value. And so, by the way, we believe is every human being who walks on this earth, will walk on this earth, has ever walked on this earth, are of infinite value. We believe that Jesus has paid the price for each and every one of them to be saved. So I urge us all this morning, in light of these facts, to listen again to the words of Jesus. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near Repent and believe the good news. If you're trusting in your good works or how righteous you are or how holy you are to save you or to redeem you, then you are trusting in the wrong thing. Repent. Believe in Jesus and who he is and what he has done. And you will be saved. Remind you of who we are and what we're about. We want people to meet Jesus. We want people to encounter the real living Jesus, the one who gave his life for them. And so we want to grow to be more and more like Jesus. We want to be holy people who walk this world in a different way. We want to share Jesus' message that anyone from the highest to the lowest can know God for themselves. We want to share the amazing, wonderful story that God isn't interested in the color of your skin He's interested in the content of your character. We want people to meet Jesus. We want to love people the way Jesus loves. We want to encourage them and bless them, share the love of Jesus with them. We want people to meet Jesus. They can do that uh, by trusting in Jesus and what he has done for us. My song of reflection this morning simply says, Happy if with my latest breath I may but gasp his name. Preach him to all and cry in death, Behold, behold the Lamb. We have no other argument. We have no other plea. We have nothing else to boast in. We can't go and say how wonderful we are. We can't. There's nothing we can boast about. We can only boast in the fact that Jesus died and that he died for me. Let's sing this song together. Happy if with my latest breath I may but gasp his name. Preach him to all and cry in death. Behold, behold the Lamb. We have no other argument. We want no other plea. 
it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Let's pray. Father the God, this morning we want to thank you for the amazing work of Jesus Christ. We want to thank you that before him we all stand as equals. Equally condemned by our sin, but equally loved by you. Father God, I thank you that, for that this morning. Father, I thank you that your word reminds us that it's not because of who we are and what we have done that we are loved by you, but it's because you just love us. and have paid the price for us to be righteous, to be holy, to be redeemed. Father God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here today who's trusting in their own good works to save them, in their own implicit goodness, in their own inherent wonderfulness, or perhaps they're trusting in their family or their culture or their ancestors or the good works of generations past, Father God, I pray this morning that you would come and speak to that person by your Holy Spirit. Bring them to a place of repentance and faith. Help us to boast in nothing except Jesus Christ. Him crucified. And all of this we pray in his precious and powerful name. Amen. And amen. I invite the worship group to come and sing our final songs this morning. If you're here today and would like to talk to me about the things I've spoken about or you feel the Lord is calling you to respond in some way, come and talk to me this morning. I'd love to share with you the good news about Jesus. Thank you. <laughs>